Well, good morning. Welcome to the second day of Connected Creativity. And uh, we've got quite a jam-packed schedule for you today. Uh, I'm going to do an opening, a few opening comments just to put us in perspective, and then we'll jump right into it with our guest speakers. Eric, may I please have my slides? We quietly crossed a threshold in the past year, which is that we've entered the second century of electronic media. And the dynamics of this second century are going to be dramatically different than those of the preceding hundred years. Um, just ten years ago, here at, the, at MIP, uh, across the street in the Palais, I had the opportunity to make a demonstration of some brand new software. It was the first time ever that we demonstrated streaming video on mobile phones. And of course, in 2001, that was a preposterous notion because mobile networks were barely capable of sending a video signal. But we were able to do it, and we showed that for the many TV companies that are present at MIP. Uh, and it was the beginning of this new century, the beginning of a new era of telecommunications. And I thought that was a good occasion for me to start uh, thinking about some of the changes that have occurred. We've had this tremendous shift in the last 10 years. It's worth reflecting on the fact that back in 2000, just a decade ago, there were only 250 million people using the internet worldwide, and there were 500 million mobile phones in existence, but they were very incapable. They were capable of text messaging, a little bit of WAP services, and of course voice services. Look at the great change that's occurred in the last 10 years. So just in a 10 year span, we now have a tenfold increase in the number of internet users and a tenfold increase in the number of, the number of mobile phones that are in use around, around the world. Now, a speaker yesterday made reference to this stat, and I thought it was useful to point out for the multimedia companies, the broadcasters, the TV companies, the production companies, those who are focused on rich media, what's perhaps more important is the number of broadband users. Today, there are 555 million people accessing broadband internet through fixed line connections, and 1 billion accessing broadband through their mobile phones. So in the first case, it's about 25% of the fixed line subscribers and about 20% of mobile subscribers. But of course, they're not spread out evenly around the globe. And so if you take a picture of the world, you'll see that there's a lot of room for growth. So there's a total of about 3 billion broadband internet uh, users in the world. We still have plenty of room to grow before the entire planet is connected. But it's quite clear at this stage, where we're about halfway through that process of connection, that in the not too distant future, everyone in the planet will have access in some way, through their phone, through their commu computer, or some other new device. They'll have access to all of the world's knowledge, all of the world's information, all of the world's media. This is actually kind of a, a powerful thought, an exciting one to begin with. And that thought hasn't been lost on Wall Street. Recently, Business Insider, ju just before the Comcast and NBC merger, they published this chart, which I thought was quite interesting. You know, 10 years ago, when I spoke to the TV companies about the internet and about broadband and mobile, they were unaware of the potential, and many of them were in a state of denial about the potential to monetize video and to monetize content on the web. And some of those attitudes remain in place to this day. So this chart shows you that from Wall Street's perspective, the value of the new media companies compared to the old media companies is just about equal. But consider the statistics I just shared with you, and you'll see that the momentum is clearly on the side of the new media companies. So we're at the, at the threshold of a very exciting new century, an opportunity for tremendous growth. Let me share with you some of the dynamics that drive this new, this new second century of electronic media. The first one is the telephone. Uh, the notion really here is that telephony has absorbed all forms of media, print, radio, music, television, games, and so forth. This morning, we're going to have representatives from each of those industries talking to us about the cutting edge experiences that they're developing and ways to take advantage of this. Now, of course, when I talk about the telephone, I'm not really referring to this old telephone here. What I really mean is that two-way connection, the notion that you can send and receive, that everyone can participate in a meaningful way by getting a signal, but also by creating signal and sending it back out. That's a profound shift. Uh, it, it actually affects the core of the media businesses. Many of the media business, businesses that we're familiar with, uh, particularly games and, and television, well, the core of what drives value there is a closed garden mentality, a walled garden mentality, a closed network, if you will. And that is under tremendous pressure today. Because a fundamental characteristic of this new two-way network is openness. 
the concept of open standards, open protocols, open source software, open APIs, and open platforms that allow anyone to develop. And as a direct consequence of this, we've seen this tremendous proliferation of creativity, a, a surge of new types of sites, uh, social media sites that emerge almost overnight. There are literally thousands of new websites that involve some form of social media, some form of uh, social communication. Yesterday afternoon, we saw six new examples of companies. These are companies that don't need anyone's permission to publish. They can simply develop their software on the open platform, on the open standards, integrate open APIs where possible, and they can launch it. They can be in business. That is hitherto unknown in the media business. So this is a tremendous shift. Now, in contrast, if you consider cable television, here's a cable TV box, and it would be hard for me to tell you what year this cable TV box was put in the home, because it hasn't really changed much in the last 10 years. There's been basically no innovation apart from VOD and the, the DVR and the set-top box for the past 10 years. So there hasn't been a tremendous amount of innovation there. But now imagine on the terminal side, the incredible amount of innovation that we're, having, we're seeing uh, in the past 10 years, this shift from uh, basic cell phones to smartphones, a tremendous change. And now, of course, we've got the invasion of the tablets. 2011 will clearly be the year that uh, dozens and dozens of new form factors are int introduced. Yesterday afternoon, Ned Sherman gave us a great overview of the new devices that are coming and noted that in addition to Apple, which currently dominates the tablet market, there are at least 40 new uh, Android-powered devices coming from various manufacturers. And so by the end of this year, you'll see tremendous proliferation in form factor, shape, design, and so forth. New types of devices that will enable new kinds of experiences at a variety of different price points. But the innovation isn't just on the display terminal side. It's also on the content creation side. The price of a high-definition camera has dropped now. For about 125 euros, you can purchase a flip camera. That's basically free. So the barrier of entry, the barrier that was preventing people from creating their own multimedia content, that barrier has been erased. Now, anyone who is serious about creating a film can do so today. They can shoot it with their flip camera and upload it to YouTube instantaneously. And so it's possible for anyone to create video. And of course, most of our mobile phones today, thanks to packet video technology, most of those phones have the ability to record video as well. And so everyone's carrying a video camera around in their pocket. Not surprisingly, there's been an incredible surge of video on the web. This stat was published by YouTube. This statistic was published in October of last year. And I thought it was quite astonishing, but very few other people noticed it. It wasn't widely remarked upon, but it has profound implications for the TV business. Every minute of every day, 35 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube. That's staggering. A day and a half's worth of video is uploaded every minute of the day. So consumers are creating video in massive quantities. And if you've noticed on YouTube, you'll see that the quality has also increased tremendously in the last five years. So in early on, there was a vision from the television company that most of what happened on YouTube uh, was, you know, stupid pet tricks or people trying to show their skateboarding skills or something. That's shifted a lot now. You're starting to see consumers generate really high quality programming. Again, this puts pressure on traditional television and it steals viewership. It, it definitely uh, erodes the viewership of regular TV programming. And so that poses a conundrum. Some of our panelists today will talk about that. Now, this is the ugliest slide you're going to see today. It comes to us courtesy of Morgan Stanley. Let me try to decode it for you briefly. If you look at the red, that's what's important. On the left side is access uh, via fixed line, and on the right side, it's access to the web via mobile networks. And if you look at the red segment, that's streaming video. So on the left, in prime time in North America, about 21% of the broadband bandwidth is used up by Netflix, by consumers streaming Netflix video. It's a video on demand service that's available in the United States. It's an over the top service. It's sold outside of the cable system, outside of the pay TV system. 21% of the bandwidth is absorbed by Netflix, and another 10% is absorbed by YouTube, and a further 6% is absorbed by flash video services and various other video services. About 37% of the bandwidth and fixed line is absorbed by, uh, by online video. And on the right, just look at that growth. Uh, in, in just a, a nine month span in 2010, the consumption of, of video in mobile devices surged from 27% to 40% of the video, that, uh, of the bandwidth that's uh, available for broadband in mobile devices. And so you're seeing a tremendous take up of online video services. Again, it's a big shift in consumer habits that's occurring right now. The story of Netflix, it, it's worth spending just a minute talking about them. Netflix previously existed as a company that would supply you with DVDs by mail. 
And the, the primary uh, offering there, the benefit to the consumer there was no late fees. So you subscribe, you basically subscribe to a, a DVD by mail service. Um, but about, about a year ago, two years ago, they introduced a streaming video service and they've been very successful. They've now converted about 60% of their subscribers to streaming video. And in, their doing, in so doing, they have created a new habit, the habit of instant viewing on demand. And this service has proven to be tremendously popular. Today, Netflix has 21 million subscribers. Uh, they added about 5 million subscribers last year. If they were a cable network, if they were a cable MSO, they would be number two to Comcast, the world's largest media company. If they were a premium cable channel, they would be number two to HBO. Last year, they surpassed, uh, uh, they surpassed um, the, other the other channels, Showtime and, and Stars in the United States. So Netflix is coming on very strong. Now today we're going to get uh, a perspective from Europe because we'll have uh, Zauza represented just shortly in a few minutes. We'll learn a little bit more about how uh, a similar service is playing out here in Europe. So to an audience that grew up with computers over the last 10 years, their perspective is that WWW no longer stands for the World Wide Web. It stands for whatever, whenever, and wherever. They get to watch whatever they want. They're accustomed to seeing the content of their choice on the device of their choosing at the time of their choosing. In other words, programmers have relinquished control over the programming to their audience. This is a change that is irrevocable and unstoppable. We're shifting from a world of fixed media. We've seen the music industry basically collapse in the past 10 years. This concept of content shift on shiny disks, so it's over. It's a thing of the past. To pure information products that can be shared instantaneously. We're shifting from a world of physical products, like books, the oldest media product in the world. We're shifting over to a world of virtual goods, here represented by virtual games, uh, virtual prizes and virtual currencies in games like companies like Zynga and Scoreloop, who will be joining us shortly. We're moving from a world of one-way programmed broadcasting to a world of a two-way dialogue where the audience actually, actually has an opportunity to play a meaningful role in telling their own story, participating in the narrative. We're moving it from a world where attention is, is directed into channels, where scarcity can be imposed because a program is only available at a certain time. We're moving from that world into a world of markets, where content is available and must compete on the same level basis with all the other content. And it can be a variety of different types of content competing for the same attention span, where consumers have the power to create their own playlists. Again, a tremendous shift in the economic drivers of the TV business. We're moving from a world of search to a world of social discovery where your friends and their preferences start to direct your attention. For instance, uh, a good, good, good example of that is Flipboard, uh, the, uh, the iPad magazine that is really programmed, if you will, by your friends' likes and their Twitter hashtags and so <laughs> forth. We're also moving from a world where the viewership, the role of the audience is no longer just passive. They're no longer there to just consume, but instead they play a meaningful role. And by this, I don't just mean people voting on American Idol or their favorite pop video program, because we're starting to see the effects of this spread out outside of the media sphere, outside of the telephony sphere, sphere. We're starting to see it spill out into politics, into political action. Vivid examples of that in the last few months from around North Africa, or, uh, regions where people are using social media tools to organize. Now, some have dubbed this the social media revolution or the Twitter revolution or the Facebook revolution. In my opinion, that's overblown. But we can't overlook the significance of these tools in allowing ad hoc groups to form autonomously, le leaderlessly, instantaneously, allowing people to find out when and where to show up. This is a powerful new development. And it actually, in my view, could change the way uh, democracies work or the way governments seem to work in the future. So the potential here is no longer just limited to the media business that actually starts to spread out into other parts of our lives where we use these tools to communicate and connect. Uh, so much so that in North, uh, in North Africa they actually have a imp the impression that Mark Zuckerberg is a good person. Apparently they haven't seen the film yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, implica the implications of this spread out far beyond content, of course, because we're moving into a world of pure information where every industry is affected by this. And in closing, let me just give you three quick examples of that. In biology and medicine, there's a new generation of scientists, beginning with high school students, who are beginning to use the same tools, open source software and open source coding, to reprogram biology at the cellular level. And so here you see an open source program that allows high school students to swap synthetic biology parts in their experiments. So we're starting to see that same concept that drove so much innovation on the web beginning to infiltrate the science of biology. 
in manufacturing. This old industrial assembly line is still recognizable to us, even though it's a photo that's almost 100 years old. But today, if you were to visit an auto plant, what you'd see is an army of robots where that production process has been turned into proprietary information, proprietary information owned by that company, and that information can be reused. The value then has moved from the labor force into a kind of informationized uh, uh, process. And one further example is 3D printing. How many folks are familiar with 3D printing? How many have followed this new trend? It's really quite a phenomenal idea. Uh, you're starting to see them uh, use the tool, the 3D printer, to virtualize manufacturing in the same way that the change that has occurred to, to fixed media in the last 10 years. Uh, 3D printers allow anyone to design a 3D object and then they can upload and share that information over the web and someone else can download that 3D plan and on their own desktop they can manufacture it. Now today most of the, most of the home uh, systems are very small and so you can only produce a little plastic part and that seems perhaps uh, easy to dismiss if you're a big manufacturer. 3D printers have been in use, big 3D printers have been in use by manufacturers for many years. But in the not too distant future, it'll be possible for people to begin to manufacture their own products as well. And so in the same way that consumers are generating music and generating videos of their own, in the not too distant future, if you have a plan, you'll be able to make 3D objects, eventually manufacture on your own. And just to give you a little example of that, here is a, the first 3D printed car. So if you consider what one of the biggest expenses and time, con time commitments uh, for uh, auto manufacturing is retooling a factory to make the car body. Here you can print out a version of the car and if you don't like that version once you've printed it out, you can melt the thing and reuse that material and print it again until you get the shape that you like. And so this is actually kind of a profoundly different approach to manufacturing. So where we are then is we're moving from this world of fixed media, discrete uh, analog channels to a world of information that can be freely shared and manipulated by all those who are participants within it. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So with that, I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists up on stage so that we can begin our first session to talk about monetizing digital media.